Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming to this topical review session. Uh, I am Carmen Jimenez from CMAT in Madrid. And let me introduce uh, Daniel Mira, a researcher at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, that together with Guillaume Rousseau, who is online, is going to present a review on, hello, Guillaume. <laughs> hello, <laughs> how are you? <laughs> So it's, they are going to present today a review on high-performance uh, computing-enabled technologies for high-fidelity combustion simulations. So, Daniel. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. And I would like first to thank the, the organizers of the conference uh, for the invitation. It's a very great pleasure uh, and honor for me to be here presenting uh, some of the activities that are conducted in high performance that can help and support uh, um, the combustion uh, simulations. So this presentation was uh, supposed to be given uh, by Guillaume and myself, but unfortunately, Guillaume has not been able to travel and he is connected online and he will be available for the part of the questions and, and answers. So let me get started. So we work at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, which is uh, located in the northeast of Spain in the city of Barcelona. And uh, we host the national supercomputer that is in Spain that is named uh, Mare Nostrum. Mare Nostrum is a tier zero uh, machine which uh, represents the uh, most uh, powerful uh, supercomputers in Europe. At the moment, uh, Mare Nostrum is in the process of an upgrade uh, that uh, will be a, uh, one of the three Prexa scale uh, machines that uh, will be available in Europe and it will provide in the order of 300 petaflops for, for computation. So if you, I can give you a little bit of motivation about how numerical simulations can contribute in the field of combustion. If we take as an example the aviation sector, we have seen in this conference and throughout the different presentations that there are uh, different initiative, initiatives that uh, aim to reduce the uh, carbon dependency on the transportation uh, in aviation. One of the uh, main uh, lines is the integration of su sustainable aviation fuels in uh, for aero engines that uh, is uh, meant to be uh, uh, most of the SAF uh, will be considered drop-in, so it is expected that uh, simulations uh, will contribute for high TRL uh, systems. In another uh, um, initiative that is, uh, is considered in aviation is the integration of hydrogen combustion that uh, brings a, a low TRL technology to the aero engines. In this case, it is expected to perform some uh, um, modifications and in injectors and combustion chamber, so it is considered a low TRL technology. So for both uh, high TRL technologies and low TRL technologies, numerical simulations are expected to make important contributions for the understanding of the complex physical phenomena that happens in the engines. Together with experiments, they can uh, provide uh, additional information in regions where uh, the experiments is, are not able to access. So if we consider what we can achieve uh, today in terms of uh, combustion simulations in the, in the context of DNS, we can take as an example the numerical simulations conducted by Atili et al. in 2015. In this case, they uh, study uh, a shooting flame uh, with a Reynolds number uh, of 15,000 uh, at atmospheric uh, conditions, and it uh, required in the order of 500 million cells and in the order of 1 billion particles. So for this simulation, it was required the full IBM Blue Gene supercomputer with 65,500 uh, core, uh, 65, cores, and it required in the order of 220 uh, petaflops. So if we do um, pressure, uh, if we do an extrapolation in terms of pressure scaling, Reynolds number, and more realistic fuel description, we can see that in order to achieve this type of simulations, we will need to increase the computational resources by a factor of 10 to 4. So in this case, we can see that uh, to perform the simulations that uh, will provide the fundamental understandings of the physical phenomena in shooting flames, we will require in the order of the X flops. 
If we do a similar exercise in the case of LES, and we consider as a reference the numerical simulations that uh, we conducted about a swill uh, stabilized hydrogen flame in the burner that is located in the Technical University of Berlin, and then we see that uh, performing simulations of atmospheric conditions using tabulated chemistry, uh, it required in the order of 100 uh, hours using 6,400 6, uh, CPUs. This was uh, for a simulation of 30 milliseconds of physical time. In fact, uh, if we want to do a simulation overnight, uh, considering uh, eight hours of duration, this can be uh, achieved uh, considering 100,000 uh, CPUs. In fact, these are uh, the resources that uh, are available in, in the most powerful supercomputers. However, if we uh, go to more realistic fuel conditions, uh, for example, uh, with a pressure scaling, we see that uh, to achieve a simulation overnight under such conditions, we will require in the order of 1 million CPUs. So this is actually a bit far of the current supercomputing uh, capabilities. If we see that uh, we can achieve this type of simulations with supercomputers, it is important to understand first how is uh, defined, uh, what is the architecture of the supercomputers that can allow us uh, to take uh, this type of simulations and proceed uh, with a high uh, performance and, and high efficiency. But uh, if we take, uh, for example, our supercomputing uh, Mare Nostrum as example, and then we consider the elements that we have in a supercomputer, the most fundamental element is the core. The core is the element uh, responsible to perform the arithmetic operations. If we, this, these cores are uh, contained in what we call a CPU, and each of the CPUs can contain several uh, number of cores. There are CPUs with 24, 48, or different type of numbers. Then the most important element at the end is the, is the computing node. The computing node is a device that hosts the memory, that hosts uh, the CPUs, and different type of nodes can have different uh, number of CPUs. Most uh, modern uh, supercomputers are integrating uh, accelerators into the, into the nodes in order to obtain a higher uh, computational uh, power. These nodes are then uh, included into what is called uh, the racks, and then if we consider all the racks, then we end up uh, building a supercomputer. So what the supercomputer at the end is just nothing but uh, a bunch of, of nodes that are put together and, and trying to perform operations in parallel. Considering this uh, division of uh, components, we can see that uh, we can anticipate different levels of parallelism. We have parallelism at the core level or at the chip level. We can have parallelism at the node level, taking advantage of the shared memory that is available at the node. And also, uh, we can do distributed uh, parallelism by communicating the information that we have on the different nodes. If uh, we can make a, 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 an example that uh, how this can actually be used uh, when we run our combustion simulations, then uh, we can consider as example, for example, a computational domain that uh, is represented here by, by a flame. So in this case, if we want to proceed a, a, an execution in sequential mode, we will have to run over all the cells that uh, we have in our computational domain, and we will have to solve all the equations for each of the cells. However, we can take advantage of uh, parallelism, and then we can divide our subdomain in what we call uh, partitions or, or subdomains, and then we can assign a, a one of these partitions to each of the computing nodes of the supercomputer, and they can perform all the operations in parallel. Then, at some point, they will have to communicate the information, but most of the computation can be done in parallel. Another level is considering uh, when we have our uh, uh, subdomain, and then we can take advantage of the shared memory and perform operations uh, considering the threats that are available at the nodes. And finally, uh, modern uh, chips uh, are uh, vectorial chips. They allow to perform vectorial operations. So instead of uh, performing uh, operations one by one, we, they can perform several operations at the same time. This is called single, single instruction multiple uh, data operators. 
On the other hand, if we consider uh, uh, from the distributed uh, memory when we have our partition, instead of going to OpenMP and, and threading, we can take advantage of the existence of the accelerator and we can perform all the operators on the accelerators. The accelerators are actually quite, uh, they introduce a high level of uh, parallelism because despite that the individual threads are uh, less, fa uh, less powerful or are uh, slower than those of the CPU, this uh, um, low latency is hidden by the increase of parallelism available in the threads of the GPU. And if we look at the, the, the performance evolution of the supercomputers over the years, we can see that uh, this curve is always increasing, which is actually uh, good news for us. So the computational power that is available every year in the supercomputers, is, it keeps increasing. In fact, it is important to know that, uh, for example, the, the processor units that we have in our smartphones of today are a, a more powerful or as powerful as the supercomputers that we had uh, back in the 90s. So you can see that if this trend is maintained over the next year, this introduces a lot of opportunities for the simulation of combustion systems. In fact, if we look at uh, the top uh, five uh, supercomputers that we have uh, in the world, we can see that uh, four of them already contain accelerators in the, in the, um, in the node. Indeed, if we look at uh, more closely the evolution of accelerators in the top 500 uh, most powerful supercomputers, we can see this graph that is quite uh, remarkable and shows clearly that uh, the, the use of accelerators is becoming more and more dominant in the uh, next generation of uh, supercomputing architectures. In fact, uh, the accelerator is a key element uh, for exascale computing because it provides a uh, additional throughputs uh, for the calculation with a much lower uh, energy consumption than the current uh, CPUs. However, this comes with the price that uh, we end up uh, with a much more complex system and heterogeneous architectures, and this means that uh, eventually we will have to adapt uh, our codes in order to run on these architectures. So now we have the big questions that uh, all the CFD developers have. Can we refactor? Uh, our codes to use efficiently this uh, new dimension of resources or I have to design my code from scratch. I will try to, to go back uh, to this question throughout the, the presentation. So let me go uh, uh, into the description of the different methodologies that we can use to describe high fidelity uh, combustion simulations. I will try to be brief here because everyone is very aware of the uh, physics involved in the combustion. In fact, uh, as we all know in this room, uh, the simulation or the modeling of combustion systems is very complex because it involves a, a multi-scale, multi-phase and multi-physics phenomena. For all this reason, in order to to obtain accurate representation of the, comp of the fluid phenomena, we have to use advanced uh, computational methods, for example, large eddy simulations or direct numerical simulations. But these techniques are uh, computationally very expensive and they need to come always with the uh, algorithms and high performance computing uh, techniques in order to make them uh, feasible. In fact, uh, we can see for all these reasons that uh, combustion will be one of the major HPC consumers in the, uh, in the exascale area. So if we revise uh, the uh, computational ja challenges that we have in combustion science, we see that uh, we have a, a challenges associated to the description to, of the methodologies that we can use to describe the flows. We have uh, new methods and we have still to improve some methods for two-phase flows. We have to deal with the um, complex uh, problems associated to to solve the chemistry of uh, complex fuels and also uh, integrating high order methods and advanced techniques like dynamic uh, mesh adaptation. In fact, all these aspects need to come also with the evaluation of the performance. So we need to provide uh, accurate models, but also we need to ensure that the, these models are implemented correctly in the codes in order to uh, achieve a good performance 
performance and obtain results that are affordable. In fact, another challenge the, that the, we have today is how we can integrate all these methods uh, with artificial intelligence and machine learning models that uh, are still unclear how they will behave when we go to large scale simulations. In the context of this presentation, I will just uh, focus uh, on the how to deal with the reactive scalar transport and chemical integration in combustion simulations, and I will be looking at this from the perspective of the performance. And in fact, uh, you could see uh, a little more the review on, 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 on the paper regarding the different methodologies that are listed there. So if uh, we go uh, to revise uh, how we usually uh, solve the scalar transport, uh, we see that in most uh, combustion simulations, the most computationally demanding part of the calculation is the solving the reactive scalar transport. One of the reasons for this is uh, mainly because uh, we have to solve this equation for sometimes for a large number of species. If the reaction mechanism to describe the oxidation process involves hundreds of species, we will have to solve one hundreds of times the equation that is uh, listed there. And this uh, ends up uh, with a large number of degrees of freedom that are function of the number of species and the number of cells that we have in our computational domain. The second aspect is uh, how to deal with the chemical integration. This is one of the, uh, well, the classical problems in our community, how we can uh, solve efficiently the nonlinearities associated to the chemical integration, uh, how we can obtain, uh, evaluate these terms in a fast and, and efficient way. And then the third aspect is associated to the load imbalance that is caused by solving this equation. For instance, in this figure is represented a um, a sketch of a, of a flame that in red is represented the region where uh, we have chemical reactions. As you can see, the chemical reactions occur usually in thin layers and there are parts of the domain that they do not require the integration of the chemical source stems, but uh, other parts that will have a lot of cells involving the chemical integration. How we can deal with this load imbalance in, 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 in the simulations? It's uh, one of the challenges that we also have today. So in this presentation, I will try to address uh, these problems from the perspective of the computational methods. So if we start by evaluating the equations of for reactive transport, and I can make this uh, change of notation, and we can see that the reactive scalar transport is evaluated by the convection, diffusion, and source term operators, represented in, in by C, D, and S, respectively. If we see uh, what we usually do in our CFD codes is uh, we want to uh, evaluate uh, these, uh, these terms and basically we run over all the cells that uh, we have in our domain or in our subdomain and then we add on the right hand side if we are using explicit methods the contribution of the convection, diffusion and the source term. In fact, uh, what we can do uh, also is to take advantage of the vectorial uh, uh, processors that allow you to compute uh, more uh, data at the same time. And what we can do is we can use the, co the concept of vectorization. The concept of vectorization is nothing but uh, that uh, we can group the number of uh, cells in what we call here an array of vector size, and then instead, instead of uh, running over all the number of cells that we have in our subdomain, then we will ha have to run over the number of packs that uh, we have created by the group of cells. In this case, if the uh, uh, processor allow us to do this vectorial operation, we can accelerate uh, substantially the calculation. I'm just gonna give you an example in which uh, we apply this technology and and then uh, considering as example uh, the classical uh, Prekinsta Barner. So in this case, we use a hybrid mesh of 36 uh, million elements, and then we use our flamelet solver in the context uh, of LOMAC. So in this case, uh, what we do is in the first step, because this is a hybrid mesh, the first thing that we need to do is we need to organize the, organize the elements by type. So what we do is at the beginning of the calculation, uh, we just uh, sort all the elements by the types. Then in the second step, what we do is to group the elements by a factor, uh, which could be a four, 10, or a, a given number in this, and we call this vector size. And then as I 
explained before, we are assembling these packs of elements all at the same time. So, in fact, if we see uh, what will happen if you perform this calculation, we see that uh, we obtain uh, a speed up in the order of seven for the assembly in the case of the scalar transport, the energy equation and the progress variable. And then we obtain an acceleration in the order of 4.5 in the case of the Navier-Stokes equations. But in fact, uh, this uh, strategy has been known also in the literature, for example, in the work by Thirwes et al, in which they uh, develop a, 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 a automatic generation of C++ code uh, for a given reaction mechanism, and they took advantage of the vectorial operations to accelerate the computations. They obtained a speed up in the order of four in the evaluation of the uh, global time step. In the work by Curtis et al, they perform a similar strategy for the chemical integration and then considering the single instruction, uh, multiple data vector processing, and they managed to obtain an acceleration of 35 uh, for the chemical integration. In fact, uh, this is a kind of the first steps towards the strategy to using GPUs because we can take advantage of these uh, vectorial operations also for the GPUs. In fact, uh, these are the results that uh, they obtain in when we try uh, to accelerate the code ADVBP uh, for using GPUs. And then what you can see here in the slide is that uh, they evaluating uh, the, the, the acceleration of the calculation with GPUs for different versions of the code ABBP developed by Serfax, and they compare this uh, speed up uh, on different uh, or different applications. Uh, if we look at, for example, the industrial combustion chamber, they managed to obtain an acceleration in the order of five by just uh, doing the operations in the GPU. If we move to, to the second uh, topic uh, of the discussion is the chemical integration. So as uh, we discussed, the chemical integration usually occurs in thin layers and it's usually associated to a high uh, computational cost. In fact, uh, you can see, for example, in this uh, flame that you see on the right, that the chemical reactions mainly occurs in this part of the, of the flow. Indeed, uh, we have different strategies that can uh, accelerate the computation of the chemical source stems. The first one and the most obvious one is, of course, to reduce the chemistry. If we use a reduced reaction mechanism, the chemical integration becomes uh, less expensive. We can use also a, a tabulation that uh, provides a, 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 well, you don't have you can resolve the chemical integration prior the calculation and then you just recover the source term. And then another methodology that can also be used to accelerate the chemical source term evaluation is the use of dynamic chemistry, the adaptive chemistry, which reduces locally the reaction mechanism and then it um, introduces a less effectiveness uh, for the integration. Another aspect that can be done for uh, acceleration of the chemical integration is of course to develop a more advanced uh, stiff solvers that can accelerate the calculation of the chemical source stems. Another possibility is also to use GPUs for this type of uh, calculations. And finally, if we want to accelerate the chemical integration part, then we can deal with the problem of load balancing that I introduced uh, previously. So let me give you uh, an example that uh, we have been working on in collaboration with the Technical University of Eindhoven, trying to accelerate uh, suit uh, calculations uh, in the context of the discrete sectional method. So in this case, if we consider the transport equations of the suit mass fractions, and then we consider uh, that, uh, and we look at uh, the source term, the source term uh, contains information about the suit, suit processes, the nucleation, condensation, coagulation, and surface growth. In fact, if we look at uh, how are the dependency of the evaluation of this source term, we see that the evaluation of this source term is actually local. It depends on the local thermochemistry uh, composition and it also requires an intense uh, arithmetic operation and most importantly this calculation does not depend on neighbors so it is independent from the rest of information of the code and then for that reason the evaluation of the chemical short terms is highly suitable for uh, evaluation with the GPUs. In fact, uh, what we did is to evaluate uh, the performance of the GPU integration of the chemical source stem for the calculation of the Sandia ISF flame. 
So after introducing OpenACC into the calculation of the chemical source term and doing a small uh, code uh, implementations and a small refactoring of the code, we could end up uh, with, a, um, with a, a profile that is given here. What you see there is in the bottom is representing the time and what you see with colors is the different subroutines involved in the calculation of different um, of different processes. What you can see is that if we follow the line of colors, you see that there are uh, certain gaps, and this means the uh, time that the GPU is waiting to do work, but nobody is giving uh, data to process. So this introduces a, a big penalty in the calculation, and then after the first iteration, considering uh, the 64 uh, sections, we were able to accelerate uh, the code uh, three times with respect to the vectorized version, and, or, and in the order of 18 times uh, respect to the serial version. However, if we put a little bit more effort on trying to do the loops and to refactor the code, we were trying to merge some loops, we were trying to do some calculations a little bit different that we usually do for the CPU, we were able to manage uh, to have no gaps in the calculation and also to use, instead of using the unified memory of the GPU, we handle the memory uh, out, uh, explicitly uh, by ourselves. In this case, we were able to fill the the, the, the work of the GPU throughout all the time steps, and therefore we were able to accelerate uh, the code 35 times respect to the vectorized version, and also in the order of 180 times respect to the serial version. What you see on the figure on the, on the bottom right is the uh, cost of the, or oh, well, the CPU time in red uh, and the GPU time in blue. What you see is very marginal the cost of the GPU compared to the CPU, and it's more remarkable as the number of section increases because there is more data to feed to the GPU. So if, we, if I go to, to the last part of the, of the presentation and then we look at the problem of load balancing, let me just uh, give you an idea of the problem associated to the load balancing. If we go to the same example that I presented before, in which we have a swift flame in this case, in which we have a premix flame with a localized region where we have chemical reactors, uh, chemical reactions, sorry, then uh, we can see that if we perform um, a, a partitioning of the mesh, you can see on the figure on the left for the internode that there will be uh, some nodes that uh, will have to perform some chemical integrations. Well, you will have some subdomains that there is no chemical integrations at all. However, if we look at, for example, the nodes that uh, contain uh, the uh, computation of chemical reactions, this is what we call intranode uh, uh, performance optimization, we can see that there will be many cells that uh, we don't do any job, and then cells that we will have to do chemical integration. So I will focus now this last part of the presentation on some of the efforts that can be done to uh, deal with the situation for the intranode uh, uh, imbalance. So, in fact, if you look at uh, a trace of the simulation that is presented here, what it represents in the bottom is represented the time, and in the vertical direction is representing the work that each of the CPUs is conducting. What you can see and is highlighted in yellow is the fact that uh, there are some processors that uh, they have to do a lot of work, and there are other processors that are not doing any work at all, and they are waiting and expecting and, and waiting for new data to come. So what you can see on the figure on the left is the evaluation, uh, again, on the Prekinsta Barner using a detailed reaction mechanism with 189 species. And then what you see on the right is the same with our reduced uh, chemistry, with a two-step chemistry model. What you can see is that the imbalance also occurs in the case of the uh, um, two-step chemistry. In fact, if we want to deal with this situation, uh, the first thing that matters when we want to do the load balancing is the partitioning. How we divide uh, our um, computational domain into different uh, subdomains. For that, uh, there are different libraries and different techniques that can be applied. The most uh, popular one, the one that uh, is more widely used, is METIS that uh, identifies the, uh, how the partition should be done. Other methods or other software that is used for this is Scotch, and we at 
at BSC, we have been uh, working on developing a strategy based on space filling uh, curve based on the Hilbert space. In this case, the Hilbert uh, curve is, is quite uh, uh, interesting because it can easily uh, represent a three-dimensional domain in a one-dimensional uh, uh, line. So this is uh, very interesting in order to do partitions because we can represent the whole 3D elements into 1D and we can chop, the, uh, chop this 1D curve into a small pieces and each of the pieces will correspond to the indexes of the elements of the subdomain. With this, uh, we manage uh, to compare how uh, this uh, way of partitioning will affect the performance and I don't know if it's too small, but we see that uh, when you compare the partitioning strategy in a static partitioning approach, uh, compare uh, the SFC compared to the METIS, we can see an additional uh, benefit in terms of load balancing. But this is, of course, uh, you have to you partition the mesh at the beginning of the simulation, and you have to deal with this all the time. But we know that the flames are transient, and the dynamics of the flame move, and we might have uh, chemical reactions and, and other uh, calculations in different parts of the domain. And of course, the load balancing also depends on the strategy that we do for uh, ensuring a, a load balancing across the different uh, levels of parallelism. So in this case, if we run, for example, a simulation, we can evaluate how good we are, we are doing by comparing the uh, speed up uh, curve. In this case, uh, this is a, a calculation that is usually conducted incremental. So we evaluate for one point, and then we are increasing the number of processors, and then we evaluate respect to this reference solution how good we are. This is, of course, not uh, the best way to, to evaluate the speed up, and there are uh, also techniques that allow to compute this in a proper way because sometimes these curves are not really representing the parallel efficiency that you have in the simulation. But what you can see here is sometimes you are losing some performance and this performance can come from different places. It could come, for example, for the load, from the load imbalance. So if we look at, uh, for example, uh, a problem and we try to increase the load balance the, the, to ensure a higher load balance, then uh, we can define our computational mesh uh, on top of the, of the, of the domain. And then, in general, what uh, the partitionings do is they uh, just uh, take uh, the cells uh, that are connected, uh, they are uh, in the same region, they put them together, and this is called a uh, contiguous mapping. So in this case, uh, the subdomain will be, will be built based on all the cells that are uh, surrounding in one region. But of course, this is pretty bad uh, for combustion simulations because usually uh, the flame is located in one place, and then this uh, ends up with situations where some of the computing nodes will have a lot of cells uh, with chemical integrations and some nodes will have pretty much no chemical integrations at all. Another uh, st an strategy that can be done, and this is available, this is very easy, and this is available in most of the supercomputers, is to do a round robin mapping. This is uh, usually given by the submission, by the, by the bash script, that then the supercomputer allows you to do a random selection of the cells that are contained in, a, in the node. In this case, we can increase the uh, internode efficiency by just redistributing and losing the locality of the data for the parallelization. And then uh, what we were investigating in, 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 in our group was uh, to try to do, to take advantage of the shared memory that uh, we have in the, in the node by using uh, the DLB library, which is uh, designed and developed by the computer science department in, in our institute. And then this uh, library allows you to redistribute the load of the processors that are not doing any work. If we look at uh, the figure of the trace on the top, what you can see is that uh, this is what we usually have in the simulation, that uh, some of the processors are doing a lot of work and some of the other processors are not doing any work. If you look at uh, what is in the bottom, what you can see is that uh, for the CPUs that are in the node, the, we obtain a, a very well balance because the processors that have finished their work uh, the threads, sorry, the threads that have finished their work can be used to perform the work of the others. So with this, uh, we can gain an additional uh, speed up in the calculation. 
If I show you uh, some examples uh, on the speed up curves, uh, what you can see here is in blue is the classical speed up curve that uh, we, con we, we, we get when we do pure MPI uh, with continuous integrate in mapping. And then what you see in, in orange is what we obtain when we do a hybrid uh, MPI, OpenMP, using the DLB library. What you can see is that uh, we obtain an increased uh, speed up uh, by just uh, rebalancing the operations that we have in a, in a single node, and also by using this round robin uh, mapping, we can get an, an extra uh, uh, performance increase. And uh, with this, I'm, I'm coming to, to the end of my presentation, and uh, I have uh, revised uh, the different aspects that can be used to accelerate and increase the performance uh, of uh, combustion simulations. And I think it's important to, to, to consider when we run our simulations, not only the physics and the numerical methods, but also the algorithms that take advantage of the hierarchy of the supercomputers. So in fact, uh, we have seen also the fact that uh, in the future, it is expected that accelerators are going to play a, a more important role in current supercomputers. And then this will bring a new opportunities, not only challenges, to our community because we can take advantage of this extra throughput uh, given by the GPUs to incorporate high order methods in our CFD solvers and also uh, to deal with new algorithms that could allow us to do the uh, computations more efficiently. And with this, uh, I'm just uh, uh, happy to, to discuss with you and to take any questions. Thank you very much. Hello. Hello, Andrea Gruber from CITEF. Very nice presentation. Um, I think you touched upon many things, but uh, one important point uh, you didn't mention. So when we go to more and more nodes, uh, the possibility of node failure increases, and this uh, can be very costly in terms of wasted CPU time because the calculation crashes and frustrating for us user. And there have been, you know, proposed application level solutions to this problem, um, like Legion or asynchronous schedulers. Uh, but what do you think? So what is, where is the solution? At the application level or at the machine managing level? Okay, th this is a very good question. I think, um, Guillaume, would you like to, to answer this question? Uh, did you, did you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, well, this is one of the topics we, 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 we didn't talk about. There are many others so that we, we didn't have a lot of time to, to explain, but you, yeah, you're right. It's a, it's a very important thing. Uh, of course, from, the, from our point of view, we would like the, the supercomputer to, to, to deal with that, but we haven't, there is no magic solution for the moment. So, so you really need to, to, to put hands in your code and well, there are many ways you can duplicate the MPIs, but you have to manage it yourself. There is no magic uh, working for this kind of codes. Well, for the moment. I'm not sure if you hear well. Uh, sorry, I'm not sure if you hear well what uh, Guillaume said. Okay. Thank you for your presentation, Katharina Kose, Bielefeld University. Um, if I look at chemistry as a bottleneck. We are seeing in the chemistry domain that many uh, strategies exist to automate the chemistry. So we have this automatic me mechanism generation, automatic for potential energy surfaces, thermodynamics and whatever. Typically, they tend to increase the number of reactions, parameters and so on. And I'm wondering, now with heterogeneous chemistry also coming in in certain problems like biomass pyrolysis or synthesis or whatever, whether there is a good handshake between these routines that calculate the chemistry and the routines that then calculate the fluids plus the chemistry in the supercomputer architecture, or whether that needs some information to the developers in the chemistry domain, how they best use architectures so that this connection can be most efficient. Yes. Yeah, okay. This is a, 
indeed, this is a, a very good point. Guillaume, maybe I can, I can answer this. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, indeed, uh, the use uh, actually of accelerators it goes more in the direction that you propose, that uh, you can do part of the cal calculation in, uh, in the CPU, the one that uh, is more convenient to do in the CPU, for example, the fluid mechanics part, and the part that is uh, arithmetic, very intensive, uh, can be performed in, in the GPU. In fact, the chemistry is a very good candidate uh, for the GPU, and it has been quite a lot of uh, work on trying to accelerate uh, the chemistry on the GPU. However, when dealing with the stiff chemistry, uh, the acceleration of uh, implicit methods using GPU becomes uh, quite uh, difficult and challenging from the implementation point of view, and this uh, still remains as a, as a work in progress uh, for us. But um, this, is really the, this is really the direction that uh, we, we are taking. Thank you. Thank you.